Well, good morning. It is good to be with you all and begin this study on Paul's letter to the Galatians. Um, really excited about this study. Um, it, it's not a terribly long book in the New Testament, but one that really yields what I hope will be a lot of benefit to you, gives us some insights into not only Paul's missionary work, but also in his fight against false teachers and false teaching, even those who are among the church. Um, it may be uh, the earliest letter we have of the Apostle Paul, and he wrote it under pretty dire circumstances, as you can see in the, the preface of our material. Uh, the converts to Christ were abandoning the simplicity of the gospel. They were allowing themselves to be led away and were dealing with some pretty, pretty intense pressure from those who would seek to teach something else other than what they were taught by the apostles themselves and what the apostles were taught by the Lord. So uh, I'm excited about this study. I hope you're excited about the study. And uh, we'll learn a few things, hopefully, that will be beneficial in uh, our walk with Christ. So before we start, let's, let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we have to come together and study your word. We pray that as we read through the pages of this book, that we will take these things that we learn and apply them to our lives and teach them to others so that not only we can be built up in the faith, but others as well, and so that we will not fall into places of false teaching and be our, allowed ourselves to be led astray by those who would teach other than what we find in your word. We thank you so much for this good church, our elders, and we Thank you so much for your word. Pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So in the introduction, we'll be beginning in Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, and then we'll talk about a little bit of history. As you may have already noticed in the course outline, this is a 13-week quarter, but we only have 12 lessons. I will have more information about that at another time. We're going to have kind of a pause for one week at the request of the elders. So let's get right, get right into our study in uh, Galatians chapter 1. And we're actually not going to start with um, talking about the region of Galatia. We're going to end with that. So what we want to talk about is some, some very basic fundamental information um, because especially as you I'm sure are aware with reading about Paul, the different letters that he wrote, it's all about context. Sometimes you have to go back a verse or two. Sometimes you have to go back a chapter or two in order to see what it is that he's talking about. So immediate context is really important in understanding what he's talking about in this letter and others. How well did the author know his intended recipients? Because we're talking about Galatia. This isn't like he wrote it to the church at you know, some street name. Um, he's talking about one of, or to several different churches in the region of Galatia. And we'll talk about the churches and some theories that exist about who this may have been written to. Did he write the letter to instruct, commend, or rebuke his readers? Was the letter written in response to certain events, or was it written with some future goal in mind? These sorts of questions must be considered when approaching any letter, including biblical letters like Galatians. So go right to your questions. There's, as I'm going through the slides, questions and introduction there. So he does give a, uh, a greeting in the first few verses, but... What's important there, because this doesn't always happen, is it tells us who this is from, and that's from Paul. Well, who are the recipients? Well, it says Galatia in the very, uh, very next verse, the churches of Galatia, but who exactly is that? Well, we understand from a lot of secular history, but also through reading in the book of Acts, that this is specifically talking about, at least, the churches of Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia. It's really hard to read that print. 
The, uh, the third question that we want to talk about is, what is the nature of the letter? Well, a lot of what he talks about here is not only having to demonstrate his apostleship, but also what I call refuting the agitators, because there are those who are teaching a different gospel, as he points out later on in chapter 1. Another question that often gets asked is, when was this letter written? Well, we try to take a look at what historically we find in Scripture. We like to kind of have an idea of when we think it was written. And, you know, some might say, well, I think it was written in 46 or 48. Or well, it couldn't possibly have been written after such and such a time. So what I'm going to say is, just based on what we find in uh, Acts is that I, I kind of feel like that this was written somewhere around 51 A.D., and I have a decent reason as to why that is, um, because we find in Acts chapter 18 that Gallio was the proconsul of Achaia, and that's in verse 12. And we know historically, and that it's been documented, that that was when he was the proconsul of Achaia. It was in 51 A.D. Well, if you jump right to the verse before that, it says Paul stayed there a year and six months. Well, where was he? Go back to the very beginning of chapter 18, especially if you have these little descriptors in your Bible like I have in mine. He was in Corinth. So it's very likely that Paul wrote the book of Galatians from Corinth in roughly 51 A.D., 50, 51. I don't think that's a hill that I'm willing to die on, and I'm not going to have like serious arguments about that with people because uh, ultimately we'd be guessing, but I think it's a, it's a good date to put on there. Um, the uninspired notes in my Bible say somewhere around 46 to 48, as late as 48, but I think more than likely it was around 50 or 51. Where are the author and the recipient at this time of writing? Well, I think, as I just mentioned, that the author was probably in Corinth, according to what we see in Acts chapter 18, and the recipients were in their own respective churches, at the very least, I think, in four different cities, most of which are in southern Galatia. If you, we'll, we'll look at a map later, but it's possible that he wrote them to every church which would have been scattered all throughout the province. And then why was this letter written? In my estimation, it was because they were teaching a different gospel and possibly even adding to it. If you look in chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, and then in chapter 3 and verse 1. So he just comes right out and says in chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And then if you'll turn over to chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. So he accuses them of being foolish because they're very soon after they had been taught the gospel, they had been taught the truth, that they were departing from it and allowing themselves to be led astray by what he refers to as another gospel or a different gospel. So let's look at some of these questions here as I've sort of jumped ahead of myself, Paul identifies himself as an apostle and elaborates on the nature of his apostleship in verse 1. An apostle in general is simply one who is sent. So what is the point that he's making about his apostleship? Well, there is a reason that he brings this out, not just to say, hey, I'm an apostle. His apostleship was apparently in question and it was possibly in doubt by some or was being brought into doubt. So he provides some background information, but you have to turn over to chapter 2 in order to find that. So over in chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, 
It says, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and to me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So he's providing some background information here as to I'm not just somebody who says I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle. And you know he, he does do a, a little bit of a name drop there, mentioning several of these brothers in in the Lord that they would have known but he sort of feels like he has to because his apostleship is questioned next we want to contrast Paul's apostleship to that described in 2nd Corinthians chapter 8 23 and then Philippians 2 25 and note that the word is translated messenger in each of these passages so if you turn over to 2nd Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 23 We'll take a look at that very quickly and then compare that to Philippians 2. So 2 Corinthians 8, beginning in verse 23. If I can get over to 2 Corinthians. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. And then over in Philippians chapter 2. We'll look at verse 25 and then kind of compare the two. Philippians 2.25 says, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. So a couple of similarities there. In, in 2 Corinthians, it uses the word partaker. In both passages, it uses the, the phrase fellow worker. And then in 2 Corinthians, he uses the term our brother's. And in Philippians 2, he uses fellow soldiers. So he's contrasting his apostleship not only as being a partaker, someone who's very much their equal, but also that he is their brother, their brother in Christ, and that he's laboring, he's working, he's endeavoring to do what he is supposed to do in teaching and preaching gospel. And then he also uses sort of a military term, fellow soldier, because he is in in very much a, a fight, a war, a battle, not only with the devil himself, but with those who would wage war against Christianity. For what reason might Paul have started his letter with this statement of apostleship? Well, perfectly good reason. There were some, apparently in Galatia, that questioned his apostleship, his conversion, or possibly both. So he has to sort of lay out his resume, his qualifications, and he does that in chapter 2 in uh, mentioning several of the, the brothers, his fellow workers, Peter, James, John, and even Barnabas as those who could vouch for him. Number two, are all the brothers who are with Paul joint authors of this letter? And I'm kind of persuaded to say no, because it would seem to indicate that he was writing the letter while among brethren. Um, it just doesn't seem to me that that would make much sense, that they would be writing it with him or, or helping him to co-author it. It just seems like he was among them, which I think lends itself to possibly being in Corinth because he was there for quite a while. And I want to make sure I'm getting all of my questions in. Now, this letter is written, as we see in verse 2, to the churches of Galatia. So note the following references in the New Testament. And we'll go back to Acts chapter 16. And I won't take the time to flip through all of these, but just to kind of briefly summarize, hopefully everyone did their lesson, and you have written sort of a little summary. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 6, it says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. So we find it mentioned there. In Acts chapter 18, 
uh, 22 and 23. I forgot to amend my my uh, material. They landed at Caesarea. Then they went to Antioch, and after that, they went to the region of Galatia and Phrygia, which would include those four congregations that we hear more about in Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 1, which we often talk about when it's time to do the collection, he talks about the churches of Galatia. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, he talks about that Crescens had gone to Galatia, so he, would, he was sent there to do some preaching and teaching. And then in 1 Peter 1 and verse 1, he addresses this uh, letter to the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So one of those prominent regions where there were churches that were established. So what region are we talking about? We're talking about Galatia. Where is that? You might have already looked at a map to be able to tell where I think it's sort of over in here. But this is really what we're talking about. We're talking about Turkey. So I turned around as if there's a screen behind me. If you look there in Turkey, it it's sort of a it's kind of an odd shaped area, but it extends from the south on the coast or near the coast all the way up into the northern part of what is now modern-day Turkey. And so there is some disagreement um, as to the identity of the Galatians, meaning, uh, and you may have done some research on this in preparing for the lesson, there is somewhat of a northern Galatian view. There is also a southern Galatian view. Um, I don't know that that that's something I would be willing, again, to be a hill that I would stand and die on is, oh, it was only written to these people or only written to those people. Um, But it would seem to be written to all of those who are saved, those Christians in that region. But that is the part of the country we're talking about. And Derby, Lystra, Iconium are very much close to each other in southern Galatia. And then Antioch of Pisidia is a little bit further north and to the west. So, by the way, how do you write a single letter to different congregations? I've usually only written a letter or an email to one person. You probably have too. Or maybe you've CC'd somebody on an email where you've carbon copied it to this person but included other folks. But we're not talking about a letter or an email. We're talking about inspired scripture. So, how do you write a single letter to different churches which obviously are in different cities, four of which at least are mentioned in Scripture. Well, the letter was more than likely passed from church to church, hand-delivered by someone who was a trusted courier. And we have some scriptural basis for that. And more than likely, it was read aloud. So if you turn over to uh, Ephesians chapter 6, we'll find one of those examples. Ephesians 6 and verse 21 beginning So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. So this letter was in all likelihood hand-delivered and read aloud amongst the congregation. Over in Colossians chapter 4, we find a similar example. Colossians 4 and verse 16 it says, and when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. See that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, we find a, a third example. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 27. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. So these letters were circulated, they were read, they were read aloud. It may have been a time, uh, we're just speculating, but it may have been a time where instead of the local evangelist getting up and preaching a lesson, he's reading a letter from Paul or Peter or whoever it may have been from. Paul customarily in his letters follows his salutation 
with a note of thanksgiving for some of his recipients. It's a pretty common thing. But he doesn't do that here. Does he express his thanks for the Galatians like he does with other churches? No. Instead, what does he express? Well, he expresses his astonishment in verse 6 that they are so quickly distorting or deserting the gospel of Christ. And uh, just to sort of as a side note, Galatians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Timothy, and Titus are the only letters of Paul not to contain his customary note of thanksgiving. One of the other points that, that often gets perhaps overlooked and perhaps not is the fact that pronouns are important. And in, to a certain extent, commas are important as well. So with that in mind, who is the whom of verse 5? Because he says, to whom be the glory forever and ever, amen. Well, I would submit to you that that is God because you know I did not major in English, but it seems to make sense to me. To whom be the glory? Well, who's the whom? In verse 4, he talks about according to the will of our God and Father. He could also be talking about Jesus because Jesus Christ was mentioned in verse 3. Who is the him of verse 6? I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to another gospel. Well, him is kind of an interesting thing, too, with just how Bibles are formatted and put together. Him, if you're looking in the New King James, which is in our pew Bibles, the H is capitalized in the New King James, which would lead me to believe that that was Christ. I use the ESV, and it maybe requires a few seconds more to look at or a little bit more study because it doesn't capitalize the H. And I'm not a Hebrew or Greek scholar, but... Uh, it makes me wonder why they would capitalize it versus not, but I think that a pretty strong case can be made there that that is Christ. In verse 6, about what does Paul marvel? Well, the ESV uses a different word if you're using that. It uses the word astonished. I, am, I marvel that you are so quickly deserting him who called you. I believe that he's talking about the fact that you've obeyed the gospel, you have, it hasn't been a terribly long time, it doesn't seem, that they have been Christians, but they've already deserted it and turned to a different gospel. Well, that leads to another question. How quick is so quickly? Well, some would estimate somewhere along 46, 47, 48 A.D. is when this book was written. And if that's the case, then it's roughly four to five years at most because we know it was more than likely during or at the same time that uh, Gallia was the proconsul of Achaia, so that's 51. If you want to estimate it somewhere between 48 and 50 as to when that missionary journey happened in Acts and those brethren were converted, either way, at most, it's probably four to five years. Um, and I got to thinking the other night as I was studying, I can't think of a church that I attended in college or back home in Missouri or anywhere else where four to five years went by and that sound church isn't so sound anymore. Now some of you, you may be aware of one and you may grab me after services and say, hey, I know of this church I've never heard of one. I've heard of maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years or even longer than that, but not four to five years. So I think four to five years, especially considering the fact that you know, it would take someone a long time to travel from place to place to place by, um, by wagon or on foot or things like that or even by ship. But uh, four to five years for that time, I would think, would be pretty quickly. Well, so quickly came from when? Well, I can think of three possibilities. So 
if we think of it that way, I went one too far. So quickly would be from when they were baptized. It could also be from when the church was founded, because those could have been at different times. Or it could have been the last word or letter that they had received from Paul. And if, if you have any ideas, I'd be more than willing to entertain any of those. But the so quickly is, at the most, in my estimation, three or perhaps as many as five years that they had from their conversion or when they uh, moved into that area and identified with that congregation or just the last communication they have from Paul. Paul also alludes to this word in, in quotes there, some who were troubling the Galatians and would distort the gospel of Christ in verse 7. So first question uh, along these lines is, are the some identified? And I believe, yes, that they are. That begs the next question. Are they Christians? Are they outsiders? Are they ju- Who are these people? Well, in my view, I believe they would have to be Christians because I believe that they would have had to know the gospel in order to be able to distort it or pervert it. And then that leads to our next question. What exactly does it mean to distort the gospel? Well, the word really means, and depending on the version you're looking at, it means to distort, obviously, or pervert. Mean they're they're injecting something in or taking something away or adding something to it. Are we told what is different about their message than what Paul had taught them? Well, if we use Acts 2 as our model, which is that Jesus was born, he lived, was crucified on the cross, and was resurrected from the dead as prophesied, then that really is the essence of the gospel that they would have been, should have been taught, and then obviously that they would have needed to be baptized. But then we're, we're not told a whole lot about, at least in this section right here, about what it is that they were teaching that was different. So it had to have been one of those things that, that they were teaching that was different. We're just not told in this section of Scripture. Well, let's look at it a different way. Is it possible that Paul could teach error? Well, sure. But we look in Scripture to find out his answer. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. So he acknowledged the fact that I taught you the gospel. If I later come back and teach something that's different, Even if it's an angel that teaches something different, let him be accursed. So was it possible? Sure. Well, if not, then why does he make the statement that he does in verse 8? And then the other side of that coin would be, if so, what does that say about the nature of inspiration? Well, I don't believe that, uh, that Paul felt that he was infallible. Um, The gospel is unchanging, and these two verses in tandem bring a curse upon anyone teaching or receiving a different gospel or teaching. So I, I think it's possible that Paul could have taught error, but I don't believe that he did. Um, Even he acknowledges in these two verses that in theory, at least it's possible. Verses eight and nine are similar because they do have very similar wording. But each verse does make a different point, and what are those points? So verse 8, he says, If we or an angel preach any other gospel. Verse 9 says, If we or anyone else. So he, he kind of covers all bases. If I do it, if an angel does, or anybody else. That covers any possible source of teaching that would have been an error. Well, now I want to go and and start into a a short section on the Galatians sort of as a region. 
Who were these people? Because Paul addresses the letter to the churches of Galatia in verse 2, and he later calls them Galatians in chapter 3, verse 1. And since that term can be understood in two different senses, there's a little bit of uncertainty as to the location of all of the different churches there could have been, because we're only really told about a few. So we need to look at a little bit of historical background. The original ethnic kingdom of Galatia was located in the northern part of Asia Minor and was populated by Phrygians. They were overtaken by the Gauls, hence the name Galatia, in the 3rd century B.C. In 64 B.C., Galatia became a client state of Rome, and when their last king, Amentus, Amentus, died in 25 B.C., Augustus formed the province of Galatia and included the geographical areas of Pontus, Phrygia, Lyconia, Pisidia, Pamphylia, Paphlagonia, and Isauria. And for the most part, the Galatian province remained reorganized by Augustus throughout the New Testament period. Well, that leads us to a question. When Paul wrote to the Galatians, was he addressing Christians located in the original ethnic territory of Galatia, which would be the northern Galatian view, or more to the southern part of the Roman province of Galatia, which is called the southern Galatian view? Well, a couple of points. The only certainty that we have is that Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia were in the southern part of the country. We can see that on a map. We saw that in the map before. And these were churches that he had established in Scripture that we can read in Acts 13 and 14 on his missionary journey. But when you look at these two different views... The northern Galatian view, which was very much traditional view held until the 19th century um, and was very strongly advocated by a number of people, um, one too many. In Acts, Luke often uses the geographical districts rather than the provincial titles in describing different cities that he visited. So, for example, he wrote Perga in Pamphylia, Antioch of Pisidia in Acts chapter 13 and 14, and then Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, Acts chapter 14. Note that Antioch, Lystra, and Derbe were all located in the province of Galatia. So it's reasonable to think that Luke's reference to Paul's travels throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, Acts chapter 16, 6, and 18, 23, on his second and third missionary journeys is to those geographical districts that are located in Phrygia and Galatia and not the Roman province. The date of the letter, so far as if we want to look at whether it's 46 to 48, 48 to 50, 51, if this view is correct, the northern Galatian view, then the Galatian letter must have been written after Paul's visit on the second missionary journey, and depending on how one interprets Galatians 4.13, possibly even after his visit on the third missionary journey. The Southern Galatian view was a view popularized by Sir William Ramsey, I do not know who that is, uh, in the 1890s and held by many modern students of the letter. According to this view, the churches Paul addressed would be the ones he established on his first missionary journey in the cities of Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. See Acts chapter 13 and 14. Just because Luke, second point, used geographical districts instead of provincial titles doesn't mean that Paul did. In fact, Paul commonly used provincial titles in his letters to refer to Christians in different locations. Romans 15, 26, 1 Corinthians 16, 5, 2 Corinthians 2, 13, and 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8. We can't necessarily apply a technique that Luke used to Paul and vice versa. It's also been suggested that the phrase referring to Phrygia and Galatia in Acts 16.6 be translated as the Phrygian-Galatian region. Also, in Acts 18.23, the phrase went from one place to the next in the region of Galatia and Phrygia could be interpreted to mean that Paul went through the districts in the province of Galatia and also part of Phrygia in the adjoining province of Asia since Paul was not forbidden at that time, if you remember that section where he was forbidden to travel to a certain place. And then we can find that in Acts chapter 16, 6. 
If so, Luke doesn't record any missionary activity of Paul in the northern geographical region or district of Galatia. But even if these passages in Acts do refer to such activity, Paul's letter could still be to the southern cities of Galatia that we've already talked about. Well, what about the date? If the south or southern Galatian view is correct, then the letter could have been written soon after his visits to South Galatia on his first missionary journey. Of course, this throws a monkey wrench into everything else we've already talked about. Any later date could also be maintained with that view. So our question is, really, when Paul wrote to the Galatians generically, was he addressing Christians located in the northern or the southern part? We don't know. Anything we try to look at is, is going to be a guess. Scripture just doesn't tell us. I can't, for say, I can't say for sure because Scripture doesn't talk about it and anything we try to discuss is really going to be an opinion. And ultimately, I think even more importantly, it doesn't really change any faith or doctrinal issues. Um, it could have been to everybody in Galatia. And like I've said before, it's just not a hill I'm willing to die on. Just like, I mean, I, I pretty well believe that 50, 51 is a date that's possible for the book to be written. Am I going to have a knockdown, drag out fight with somebody about that? No. Same thing with is it written to these folks or not written to these folks? We just simply don't know. Uh, and I'm just not willing to fuss over that. So I hope this lesson has been uh, beneficial for you. What I would recommend, because Galatians is pretty short, read the whole book each week. Read chapter 1. Read chapter 1 again. Read it early in the week. Read it later in the week. Read it Monday and then read it Saturday when you're preparing for your lesson. Because we're still, next week we're going to be in Galatians chapter 1, focusing on the back half of the chapter. And we're going to specifically focus on that. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, send me an email, uh, give me a call, send me a text message, whatever. Um, I'd be happy to study with you on it. Um, but again, on a couple of these major points, like the, the date of the letter and was it to these people or these people, we just don't know and I'm just not going to fuss about it. So hopefully you enjoyed the show, the show, <laughs> the class. Wow. And uh, I appreciate your time and your attention to this material.